We're continuing with the, uh, the low carbon future theme. Uh, our final panel, panel this afternoon, which is uh, foreshortened, as I, as I told you earlier, because we have only one uh, participant along with the moderator. Um, this is the impact of COP21, the agreement of last year, on the long-term prospects of the oil industry. This session is titled Impact of the Paris Agreement on the Long-Term Prospects of the Oil Industry. And we will actually focus on uh, one particular sector. We will focus on demand and demand of the transport sector, which is a very important one for the oil industry. It's the number one market uh, for the oil industry. And until very recently, it was a quasi-monopoly of the, of, the, of the oil industry. And this, uh, this discussion and this session will be about whether this is going to continue or is, is it going to change and uh, how and uh, when. And uh, Mr. Saitre just said in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, session that it's impossible to imagine the world without oil and gas. Uh, is it impossible to imagine the transport sector without oil and gas? And if it's possible to imagine the, oil, the transport sector without oil and gas, then maybe it's possible to imagine the industry sector as a whole without oil and gas. Uh, so, Didier Houssin, who's the chairman and chief executive of uh, the IFP, the French Institute of Petroleum, uh, or more accurately, the IFPEN, which uh, IFP has changed its name a few years ago to uh, French Institute of Petroleum and New Energies. Uh, so, he's going to uh, give us a few thoughts uh, about the prospects for the transport sector, and then we'll have a short discussion and ask for your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, it was supposed to be a dialogue with uh, my colleague Kamel from the IEA, but as I spent seven years in the IEA, I'll try to integrate some IEA slides. You won't be surprised. Uh, my, <laughs> my point is just to make a few introductory remarks on this issue of uh, transport. Uh, the impact of COP21, uh, there's a lot of talk about renewables. The, it was mentioned in the previous statement, uh, the sharp decrease in the price of renewables. The, 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 the technologies exist to decarbonize the power sector. But when it comes to the transport sector, which still represents more than 22% of CO2 emission globally and almost 28% and for OECD countries, we don't have really solutions. And we don't really address in our policies the question of decarbonization of the transport sector. At the same time, the question of elect uh, electromobility is, has come to the fore. Uh, with a, a, a key question is, uh, can we see in the, in the coming decades the thermal engine and petroleum oil being replaced by a combination of uh, electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles fueled by renewable energies? It's very difficult to anticipate such a breakthrough, uh, the extent uh, of such a breakthrough, the pace of such a breakthrough, if it has to, hap to happen. Uh, but we, even if energy is about long-term trends, We've seen some uh, disruptions. Uh, if we think about shale gas, if we think about solar energy, 10 years ago I remember discussion on solar energy and the majority of people say it will never, it will never be deployed globally. So I think we should uh, uh, take into consideration all the uh, pot uh, potential game changers that are linked to electromobility. Uh, my first point is uh, about, actually the starting point is the total dominance of oil in the transport sector. In the, in the, in the left-hand chart, you see that uh, uh, first, oil is dominant, 93% uh, 90, uh, uh, covering 93% of the demand of the transport sector and increasing very sharply. I remember when I was uh, putting together scenarios at the IEA, there is one mistake we've always, uh, all, all, each time we've done in our model, is to underestimate the growth of demand uh, for mobility in emerging, and in emerging countries and developing countries. And it remains true. I mean, the, the strength of oil demand is linked to the uh, increasing need for mobility, especially in the emerging uh, countries. The second point is I will, I will uh, discuss more the question of passenger cars, where the discussion takes place for electromobility mainly. Uh, but it's just 50% of the equation. When uh, the demand transport, uh, you also have 32%, as you can see here, which is linked to uh, the freight, demand uh, transport for goods. 
and 10% uh, for maritime transport and 10% for aviation. And in these sectors, uh, displacement uh, of oil by electricity is very unlikely, uh, but other options uh, are uh, possible. Um, we, uh, another point is that uh, in terms of uh, uh, oil demand in the, in the uh, thermal engines, uh, there is still a great potential for efficiency improvement in that domain. We've seen lots of progress in terms of efficiency of uh, internal combustion engines. Uh, this uh, uh, progress can come through uh, optimized aerodynamics, therm uh, limiting thermal and exhaust losses, and also improvements in, in mass reductions. Here you see uh, what could be done to reach an objective of two liter per, uh, uh, per 100 kilometers, uh, working on all these uh, options. And the impact in terms of uh, uh, oil demand is also massive. I'll uh, come back to this in my uh, last point. So uh, is, uh, are electric vehicles a, 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 a possible game changer in the uh, coming decades? Uh, first, the starting point is very low, is uh, less than 0.1% of the global fleet, but the increase is quite, uh, is quite uh, striking, plus 70% uh, in, uh, of sales in uh, electric cars in 2015, uh, more than 1 million uh, uh, on the road uh, at the end of 2015, and, and we will reach the level of 2 million uh, probably this year. This development are concentrated in a, in a, in a, few, num in, in a few countries, uh, Europe, US, Japan, but also China. China has become the, the leader with 40% of sales of electric cars uh, last year. These deve this developments are based with a strong policy incentives, whether it's uh, subsidies or uh, developing of charging infrastructure or different tools like free urban or motorway tolls or free parking, which in many countries is a very strong driver to buy an electric car. And I can tell you that in Paris, having free parking is an extremely strong driver to buy an electric car. That this progress has all also been made possible by progress in the cost uh, of uh, uh, batteries, uh, divided, uh, as you can see on the right, by a factor of four. Uh, over the last uh, years, while at the same time we have seen a sharp increase in energy density of the batteries, allowing for much wider ranges than often three to four hundred kilometers autonomy or range is now offered by uh, many car companies. Having said that, the future progress remains very uncertain because uh, of the, uh, it, would, it would need further progress in terms of battery range and battery costs. Uh, the question of developing charging infrastructure uh, remains open for uh, in many countries. The question of uh, battery recycling is also an issue. So the future of electric mobility will certainly hinge for many years on uh, subsidies or public support, on lower prices, and wider deployment can, of course, help to uh, cut the prices and a higher range uh, for the uh, consumers. Having said that, uh, hybrid vehicles is also a solution as they allow to combine uh, optimized use of oil and electricity. Uh, we see different uh, degrees of hybridization of uh, engines uh, from a very low hybridization like a stop and start uh, to uh, global uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles uh, which are extremely uh, flexible. And uh, we see a pressure from uh, uh, um, new regulation for on the car industry to develop a hybridation to meet uh, CO2 uh, emissions uh, um, standards that are put in place uh, in particular in Europe. I think the uncertainty of uh, the deployment of electric cars will also depend on the impact of the uh, wide-scale deployment of digital uh, technology in the transport sector. We are seeing the first uh, uh, moves on that uh, on that path and some interesting changes in behaviors uh, in the behavior of a consumer moving from uh, the concept of ownership of a private vehicle as which is a sort of a traditional model uh, to considering uh, mobility as a service uh, where uh, uh, consumers can use different cars different systems different transport modes using uh, uh, using uh, apps on their smartphones uh, to take the best opportunities and it uh, particularly easy in large cities uh, 
So it's not everywhere, but we have to bear in mind that uh, by 2040, 60% of the global population will live in large cities where the constraint in terms of congestion, in terms of air quality, uh, will also be a strong driver to push electric mobility. The real-time uh, communication of mobility information allows efficient driving and, and facilitate modal shifts. Car sharing and car pooling system are being developed and they allow for a quick uh, renewable of the fleets which allows for a, a, a more a rapid deployment of new technologies. The, pos the deployment of self-driving cars or driverless cars which is uh, uh, doing the buzz now uh, can also uh, help the development of this uh, electric, uh, electromobility uh, while improving uh, safety of transport as soon as the technology will be mature, which is not the case, we've seen some problems. Uh, it will allow also better traffic regulation and better global energy uh, consumption. Uh, let me now move to the other options. Uh, first, bioenergy, as they are less uh, high on the agenda, but today they represent 4% of global uh, road transport demand. Uh, the big advantage of biofuel is that it's a diversification where you can keep the same cars and the same infrastructure, which means they can be deployed uh, rapidly. Uh, the uh, consumption of biofuels is uh, increasing on a regular basis, but we've seen a sharp drop in investment uh, against the backdrop of lower crude prices and uh, against the backdrop of uh, debates on sustainability and carbon impact of first-generation biofuels. Um, Europe has uh, ambitious goals uh, from that perspective, 10% uh, of uh, renewable energy in transport by 2020. They, it won't be, they probably won't be met, uh, new goals will be fixed. But in these time frames, electromobility is certainly not an option. More time will be needed if you, we want to have very ambitious goals in terms of uh, uh, diversification uh, of, of, of transport. The second generation biofuels or advanced biofuel is certainly an interesting option, but uh, more uh, research and deployment is needed. We worked at IFP very hard on these subjects, uh, but so far prices are uh, uh, probably too high, so they will need uh, public support and wide-scale deployment to lower the costs um, and, and become a viable option. Natural gas is an option that has existed for many years, in the, especially for the taxis or, or passenger cars. Uh, they can cover all the needs, uh, especially uh, for uh, trucks or maritime transport, uh, liquefied natural gas, which has a higher concentration in terms of energy and lower uh, space needs in terms of storage, is certainly an option, especially as new sulfur regulation for bunker fuels are developing. Uh, at international level. Hydrogen mobility, just very briefly, has been uh, high on the agenda uh, uh, 10 to 20 years ago and then disappeared. Maybe we'll come back. The Japanese uh, car industry thinks that it could become an option. We think that it can be an option for the longer term. Of course, it's a, it's a kind of electrification of mobility, but uh, uh, hydrogen has still serious disadvantages, especially the efficiency of the global hydrogen chain, if you integrate the production of hydrogen, is uh, very low and uh, it has still a high cost in terms of vehicle manufacturing and, and fueling and it also needs a global distribution infrastructure which will be quite costly at, uh, for uh, governments. So to conclude, <clears throat> the um, oil will remain dominant, but uh, revolutions in terms of electromobility uh, are not to be ruled out. Uh, in the, on the left-hand uh, part of this chart, you see some uh, uh, two uh, maps of Europe. This is a result of a study that we have uh, run with different uh, research organizations in Europe. It's a project called Selectra where we have basically two scenarios, uh, one where electric cars represent 50% of global sales by 2030, which is a conservative scenario, and a more ambitious one where uh, the sales of electric cars could reach 30% of uh, car sales in Europe by 2030 if governments put in place uh, schemes that are uh, sufficiently an, uh, um, uh, incentivizing for the consumers. Uh, my, my, <clears throat> at global level, uh, you have a variety of scenarios, extremely differentiated, conservative ones at around 7% of global sales, uh, 
Uh, Bloomberg came up with a scenario where uh, the, the, the sale of electric cars at, at, at world level could reach more than 20% by 2030. So there is a wide variety of uh, assumptions. Um, my, I think it will depend really on technology breakthrough on the battery side, uh, the uh, speed at which uh, we will see some change in behaviors on the consumer side, and, um, and also the, the, the deployment of carbon prices and policy tools by, by government. Of course, high oil prices, if uh, I heard what uh, this morning comments that we may have a price surge in the next uh, years, if you consider the very low level investment would of course accelerate the transition towards uh, uh, an electro uh, mobility. My last point about uh, is the chart coming from the uh, WIO. Uh, which shows, uh, uh, the, compares uh, 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 NP, the, in, the, in the central scenario and in the two degree scenario. You see that it's a very conservative scenario in terms of electromobility. I think probably they will come up with something more ambitious in terms of electromobility. But what is important is also the impact of uh, energy efficiency. If you uh, assume that by 2040 the global efficiency of uh, cars would be cut from uh, around 10 liters per 100 kilometers, I'm talking about the uh, worldwide average, to five liters per 100 kilometers, you end up with massive uh, uh, savings in terms of uh, oil demand. So the future of oil demand and, uh, uh, and mobility will be linked to potential breakthrough in electromobility, but it will probably take time. And also the speed at which uh, uh, energy efficiency will be improved in, in thermal engines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I have just two or three questions uh, to ask you, and then we, we we'll open to the to, to the floor. First question is about electric vehicles. I mean, a, a very well known uh, issue is regarding the development of electric vehicles is the so-called uh, range anxiety, uh, also the cost, the lack of infrastructure, and the cost of infrastructure. But we've we've seeing we are seeing now. Uh, more new models being announced, for example, at the Paris uh, Motor Show last week, the new, the new Renault Zoe, for instance, reaching 400 kilometers of range and, and other models in Europe and in the US reaching this three to 500 uh, uh, kilometers range. D does it mean that the range anxiety issue is, is behind us? And if so, is the infrastructure issue that big of an issue? If cars now are able to, to drive three, four, five hundred kilometers, is, is it really a big issue to have a charging infrastructure everywhere? I think the range anxiety is still, uh, is still a problem for the consumers. And uh, if you want to stick to the traditional model, basically uh, you have one family car to, that you use for, uh, for your, your, your going to work. And, and basically, I mean, 80% uh, of, of, of usual trips are less than 80 kilometers per day. So. The, 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 the question of range is a bit theoretical, uh, but at the same time, the, I mean, if the car still represents the, the freedom, the capacity to go traveling and traveling for long distances, which is more the, an American model than, than a European model, by the way, of course, the, the question of range is very important. But I think it's the, 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 um, the model of Tesla, for instance, which is basically combining the advantages of the electric engines, which are very strong, the efficiency of electric engines, the, the, the pleasure in terms of driving electric cars, while at the same time having a huge uh, range capacity, which means a higher weight, higher cost, uh, huge battery capacity. It's certainly not a model that can be replicated uh, all over the world because of the price, because of the, the type of consumption. There are other models that could be deployed uh, including uh, a car sharing system in urban uh, regions where you basically, in ca electric car sharing system, you don't have this uh, issue of the range and, and the cars are on a regular basis are recharged and the consumer doesn't even pay attention to the issue of, of, of range. Um, the, 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 the Zoe model of Renault that you mentioned announced a 400 uh, range capacity. I'm not sure it's always really proven uh, and it's probably an improvement and it uh, an improvement which is not exactly the same uh, the same model you know is uh, mm -hmm. if um, and it will it will assume that that you really have a deployment of public charging stations uh, 
uh, which is doable because uh, it's not like deploying a hydrogen uh, uh, distribution system. Uh, it's much easier and it can be deployed easily uh, with, uh, uh, with an application that will show where you can uh, charge uh, uh, quickly if you use your electric cars for a long trip, but not on a regular basis, rather on an exceptional basis. Okay. Uh, a question about biofuels. Uh, the proportion of biofuels of of, uh, of, yeah, of biofuel in, in, in Europe is, uh, is is 10 percent on on uh, on many many cases is there a limitation technically economically on on how much biofuel you can you can use in a in a in an engine or in a car there is the the famous blending wall uh, is, is which real? is uh, which is a real issue for the the car industry um, but there's still a potential to increase. I mean, we are far from that limit in terms of consumption and, uh, in Europe, and there are also some limitations for the deployment of uh, first-generation biofuel that we, that we all know. Uh, I have a last question about, you, you, you mentioned uh, among the countries where electric cars are, are doing well or, or better than average a few European countries, but also the US and China. Is it possible that China could leapfrog the rest of the world and, 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 and reach very rapidly uh, a much higher proportion of uh, electric cars than anywhere else in the world, which would have huge implications in terms of uh, oil demand? I mean, recent, recent trends show that, I mean, the, 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 uh, the acceleration of uh, electric car sales in China is really impressive. As I said, 40% of global sales last year were... Uh, happen in China. I think their driver is, is also uh, is air quality, mm -hmm. uh, mainly air pollution, and, uh, uh, and this will remain a strong driver, uh, more than, by, by the way, CO2 abatement, if you think of the, of the electricity mix of China, which is massively based on coal, uh, the CO2 impact is not that big, mm -hmm. although we have to take into consideration the, uh, uh, the efficiency of electric engines, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, much higher, of course, than the uh, efficiency of, uh, uh, of uh, thermal, uh, thermal engine. engines. Mm -hmm. Okay, we just have a few minutes left. Uh, we have a question there. Yeah. Um, Morten Saxe from Statoil here. Uh, on electric vehicles, uh, they are now powered by lithium ion batteries. So if you want to set up a uh, big production line, selling 20 million cars per year. You have to also set up a supply system for lithium and production of batteries. Have you calculated how much is possible, how much lithium is there in the world, what's the energy cost in converting lithium ore into batteries? Can that be done from the supply side of lithium and making batteries? Je ne sais pas quelle est la question. Je, que je crois que l'impact de la production de batteries en termes de, de coûts de, maté de, de, coût de matériaux, etc. Yeah. I, I, I didn't really capture the question, but I understand it's about the, the, the battery production yeah, cycle. Was, yeah, if you base it on lithium-ion technology, you have to supply quite big volumes of lithium. Are there volumes available? And how much does it cost to convert lithium ore into a battery? Yeah, it has to be, of course, taken into consideration in the, in the, the life cycle assessment of electric cars and the, and the impact uh, in production of, uh, uh, of the batteries, of course, uh, has also to be taken into consideration, as well as the recycling of batteries, which, which assumes that uh, uh, a recycling chain is put in place uh, if we have a wide scale we, if we were to have a wide-scale deployment of electric cars. There are a number of projects, actually, if I remember well, from a number of car manufacturers who are working on second life of batteries to be used in, uh, in grid applications, mm. which could prolong the, the, the life of, of batteries. Any other, if there's a question here? Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question that takes you a little bit away from uh, Europe and the U.S. and maybe even away from the, uh, the whole transportation sector. But um, one thing that uh, had become a big part in the early 2000s of the World Energy Outlook was what I think we were calling it energy poverty initially. It became 
uh, energy access and various other things. Uh, and that brings me to Africa. And you use the word leapfrog uh, in terms of what the Chinese might do. Well, there could be a lot more leapfrogging that goes on in Africa. Maybe transportation sector is part of that. But uh, another mutual friend of ours, Tatsuo Masuda, invited me to a conference in, uh, in New York on world energy security. But it was basically about African energy. Um, are there ways that IFP and other institutions like yourself can create some shortcuts for meeting the energy demands of Africa in a way which is more environmentally friendly? And I think that's a very large issue, from old biofuels to new biofuels, maybe. Uh, and I'm, there are a lot of big cities there, and so there is an opportunity to create transportation networks from scratch where you're not stuck with an existing infrastructure that doesn't particularly fit well with what, uh, what the real solution, optimal solution is. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I do think that the, uh, using the, the smartphones and the leapfrogging for Africa is basically used for, for the smartphones uh, rather than uh, the network uh, telephone system. It could, be, could also be used for, to deploy uh, transportation solutions that would be cost effective uh, using a uh, carpooling system, car sharing system, uh, we're based on electromobility in large cities, and, and Africa will, uh, will see its population grow and its urban population grow extremely rapidly. Uh, so I think it perfectly makes sense. I think that the traditional model, what, what we had in the WIO, and, I, and, and I'm, I speak as an alumni, uh, is in the long term scenario, basically it's difficult to model disruptions. So what you model usually is, I mean, you try to imagine some disruptions, but basically it's prolongation of current trends. And the model is clearly the American model in terms of uh, uh, number of passenger car per, pass, per, per person, etc. And if you replicate this model to China, India, and Africa, you end up uh, with a system which is not sustainable in terms of congestion, in terms of pollution, in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, so you need to invent a new model. And I think all this discussion about digital um, revolution in transport may well be used to invent new models in terms of transport that would avoid. Uh, to uh, deploy massively passenger cars based on uh, uh, combustion engines uh, 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 across the world. Okay, we have, we have a red flashing screen so here. Have to, so I, I think it stop. means time is over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. No.